Great. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining our uh, panel today. I'm Tim Vollmer from the library, and I work in the Office of Scholarly Communication Services. So our office works to help you as students and researchers and scholars. We help you understand publishing, copyright, and other intellectual property and information policy issues that are related to your um, research and teaching. So as we get settled in today, um, I just wanna give a preview of some of the other workshops and events that we're doing this fall semester. Um, so we already hosted a press books demo um, as well as a workshop for PhD students on helping to understand copyright in relation to creating and publishing their dissertations. Um, and then last week, we also talked um, to graduate students and postdocs about um, managing and maximizing uh, scholarly impact. So understanding things like metrics uh, for publishing. Now, of course, today we have a panel to talk about the ins and outs of turning a dissertation or other collection of scholarly works into uh, a book. Um, and then next week, we're going to be discussing all things open access, um, and we're going to be providing some practical guidance and really walking you through all of the open access publishing options, as well as funding sources uh, we have for you here at UC Berkeley. And then finally, we're going to wrap up on November 8th. Uh, we're doing a workshop on how to understand copyright and fair use when you're creating and sharing digital projects. So if you want to register for any of the remaining workshops, um, you can go to the link on the screen here and I can also drop it in the chat. It's just like a blog post that lists all of our programming for the fall. And there should be a link there where you can sign up um, for each of those workshops. Um, just a note, all of our workshops, at least for this semester, are being done over Zoom still. Um, so they're really open to, to anyone who, who wants to join. So today we've got a great lineup of speakers uh, who have generously agreed to share their experiences on the process of publishing a scholarly book. So perhaps some of you are working on your dissertations and might be interested in taking that uh, research into a book length treatment. So our sort of learning objectives for today through this conversation is to help demystify this process a bit. So how to take scholarship um, and take it into, into a book. So we're gonna give you some practical advice today on um, what it might take to revise your dissertation, um, how to develop a book proposal, um, some tips for interacting with um, editors, uh, we'll talk a little bit about how to address some legal considerations and hopefully a lot more. So, so before we uh, proceed into the discussion with the panelists, I just want to introduce everyone. So uh, Reina Polivka is Senior Acquisitions Editor for Music, Cinema, and Media Studies at the University of California Press. And she joined the UC Press in 2015. And Reina acquires scholarly and general interest books in music, film, and media studies. Michael Rodriguez Moniz is an associate professor in the Department of Sociology here at UC Berkeley. And before coming to Berkeley this fall, he taught sociology and Latino studies at Northwestern University. And Michael is the author of the recent book titled Figures of the Future, Latino Civil Rights and the Politics of Demographic Change. Uh, the book is an in-depth look at how US Latino advocacy groups are using ethno-racial demographic projections to bring about political change right now. Uh, and in Figures of the Future it was published by Princeton University Press in 2021. And Rachel Brooke is senior staff attorney at Authors Alliance. Now, Authors Alliance is a nonprofit organization which represents the interests of authors who want to take advantage of the digital age 
to share their creations with readers, promote the ongoing progress of knowledge, and advance the public good. And Rachel has also worked as a literary agent at a New York City agency. So thank you so much to our speakers and welcome. So just a little bit about the structure of the discussion today. Um, we prepared a short set of questions that are tailored to each individual panelist's role and experiences within the book publication process. So we're gonna use the first part of the session to talk with each of them separately. Uh, we'll start with Raina first, then we'll go to Michael and end with Rachel. Uh, then we'll ha have time for you to ask questions to the panelists uh, as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop the screen sharing now, uh, just so it's easier for us to see our speakers because we won't be needing the slides really anymore. So let me go ahead and do that. Okay, great. Um, well, Reina, let's let's start with you. Um, to kick things off, can you give us an overview of uh, UC Press? So, what sorts of books does the UC Press publish? And a more general question: Do different university presses specialize in particular subject areas? Sure. Thanks so much, Tim. Um, yeah, so UC Press has been around for over 150 years. Um, we're not associated with any specific UC Press campus and instead function out of the office of the president. Um, but we really like to support the scholarship being done across the campus wide systems um, and see uh, kind of the, the hallmark of the UC Press publishing experience is one that is really collaborative with our authors. We are typically considered the top in our field, ranked among the top presses uh, acquiring in certain subject areas. Those include the social sciences. We have a very robust list in sociology, anthropology, um, and criminal, uh, criminal justice. We also have a very strong list in the humanities. So film and media and music of which I acquire, as well as art history um, and area studies like Asian studies, Middle East studies, African studies, things of this sort. Um, every university press really does kind of stake a flag in the field, if you will, for where they specialize in their publishing. Um, and they typically, a, a good editor kind of by virtue of being in a field for a certain number of years kind of becomes a subject specialist in that area, knowing who's publishing what, what are the great peer reviewers we can get to weigh in on projects. Um, and so, so that's something you'll certainly wanna consider when you're trying to figure out the right press for you is what are the strong publishers in your field? Where is it important for you to publish? What dialogues do you wanna be involved in? I should also say that um, University publishers publish lots of different kinds of books. So scholarly monographs, which is what primarily your first book will be. Um, this is a long form scholarly um, engagement with your field, with theory, with history, with the archives, et cetera. We also publish books for a more general trade oriented um, audience. These tend to be a little bit more synthetic um, and have these kinds of, we call them marketing hooks that really get these books out to a broader readership. Um, and then we also publish books uh, primarily for course adoption. So that's another kind of thing to think about as you begin your publishing career. What kinds of books and audiences are you interested in publishing and reaching? Great, thank you. Um, well, let's dig in a little bit to some of the sort of stages of the book publication process from the perspective of you of the press. Great. So let's say I'm a PhD student with a dissertation and I'm thinking I might want to revise it into a book. Can you talk about like, where do I start? So like, what mm -hmm. sorts of things should a prospective author be thinking about or doing before they even try to contact a publisher about uh, the possibility of writing a book? Sure. Um, great question. Most first books are derived from the dissertation, but it is very important to recognize that your first book will not be your dissertation, um, that th these are two very different genres of writing in. Um, and 
so my 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 first piece of advice is just to finish the dissertation <laughs> um just get it done and so that you can move on to greener pastures of course the dissertation is something that is written for a very specialist group of readers your committee um, and it's assuming an, a certain level of expertise. It's also assuming a certain kind of register. You're demonstrating your mastery of a subject. You're quoting and citing everything in the kitchen sh kitchen sink to basically demonstrate that uh, you're where you've come from with your ideas and where you're going. Um, it's chock full of notes. Um, and it's usually written under a lot of duress, right? You're kind of writing with different deadlines in mind, maybe teaching obligations, service obligations, that job market that is ever elusive. So, so the, the, the dissertation is something that becomes a very different kind of document than your first book manuscript. Um, however, the dissertation does provide some really good jumping off points for different kinds of writing that will establish you as the expert in your field. Um, so some things to think about once you have that dissertation document defended, um, and even as you're kind of writing through it, are are there certain chapters that can be repurposed for journal articles? Um, when as a publisher, I really look towards the journal's field for um, for my authors in terms of seeding their ideas. Journals can be a really good place to kind of seed your ideas, um, develop an audience for your work, um, and get your name out there. So are there certain ch chapters that can be reappropriated at the journal level? Um, was there something in the dissertation that you just that you hit upon, but because of whatever constraints you were unable to fully flesh out and develop, often that can be that nugget that leads to an amazing first book project. Um, so the idea is that the dissertation will be heavily revised before it is ever sent to a publisher. Um, there's other ways of thinking about um, things to do while you're either writing the dissertation or in that interim period between def defense and the first book project. And that is certainly taking advantage of conferences and, um, and professional organizations, again, to present your ideas, seed your audience, what are different ways of approaching different topics you dealt with in your dissertation that might that really resonate with these scholarly audiences and take the notes from that that experience, um, that question and answer, and um, and and kind of let it track into how you conceive, conceptualize, and pitch the book project. Great. I, I think another question people might have is, um, let's say I've done some research, and maybe I think UC Press would be a good fit. Like, how should an author begin an interaction with the press? in a productive and effective way? Yeah, great question. So acquisitions editors get flooded with proposals every day. We call these over the transom, things that we have not invited, conversations that we have not yet had with people. Um, and so the best thing, the most strategic thing you can do, especially as a first time author, is to really think about how do you get your name to rise to the top of that pile. Um, one good way of doing that is kind of mobilizing your mentors or your networks. Do you have friends or colleagues who have published with a specific editor that might be able to introduce you, that might be able to suggest that they look at your work? Um, this can come out in an introductory email that you might write to an editor. Um, this might come out in a cover letter that you might send an editor. Um, this might come out in an encounter that you have at a conference with an editor. Um, Hi, my name is so-and-so. I graduated from this program. So-and-so is my mentor. Or you might know my colleague so-and-so because they published with you. Um, so, so establishing those very human connections is really, really helpful and valuable. Um, when you are, now that we are kind of attending conferences in person, it's really, this is a great opportunity to visit that exhibit hall, even at these early stages, and look at the, the exhibits from the perspective of a potential author. So what are, the, what are the books that certain presses are publishing that might really resonate with your own work? If you're publishing in a place like, if you're publishing in a field like art history or even history, um, a lot of those uh, kind of the, the production quality, the materiality of the book itself is really important to authors. So looking at how presses conceive of the publication object itself, if that's important to you. Um, 
and striking up conversations as you can with press staff, whoever is at the booth, um, and learning a little bit more about where their interests are, where they're trending, what, what areas they're looking to really build on their different lists. Um, once you have, and I think a lot of editors really they open up kind of office hours at conferences so so stopping by and 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 introducing yourself and talking about what you're working on is this of interest to the areas that they're they're acquiring in those early those early conversations are really helpful um once you do have something and i know i i imagine tim will 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 lead us down this trail eventually of the proposal but just a few words about once you do have a proposal and you do have kind of the book project solidly laid out and you're ready to start shopping it around to different presses one thing i i suggest that you do when you set up that meeting with an editor um is to not necessarily present them with your proposal and read through it and go through the exhaustive chapter outline. I see that way too often. Provide them with the proposal or better yet, email it to them before so they don't have to carry a hard copy around. And instead talk about what brought you to the project. What is what what is the, the, the passion that you bring to it? What is something new that you bring to this subject? Um, let them spend time with your proposal outside of the conference, but use that opportunity to really get to know each other and so that they know deeper about what brings you to that to that 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 book project and what will carry you through to the end. Right on. Well, let's let's dig into that the book proposal a little bit more. Um, maybe we can talk through some of the nuts and bolts. Can you tell us what information commonly goes into a book proposal? Sure. Yeah, so this is another genre of writing unto itself. Um, we see this very much as kind of like uh, there. If you think about it, there's there's kind of three different people that you're writing the proposal for, and so I like to start out with that kind of concept. So you're writing the proposal, of course, for an acquisitions editor to lure them into your work and to get them to 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 speak with you further, to perhaps send the project out for peer review. Um, to, to really commit to working with you. So you're writing it for the acquisitions editor. You're also writing it for potential peer reviewers, right? So you're writing it for peers in the field. It needs to be scholarly, certainly, and kind of show its oomph and that you know kind of what you're talking about, that you're the person that needs to be writing this book and kind of um, and pro providing a state of the field for those peer reviewers. The third person, the third people that you're writing for, and this is at least true at UC Press, is kind of the marketing department. At our press, we um, when we pitch books for contracts, we bring in people from all the stakeholders across the press, from production to marketing to publicity and sales. We want everyone to be on the same board. We want everyone to, to have buy-in to the pro project. And so thinking of the proposal as kind of a marketing document. So what is the... What is the uh, what are the competing titles that are out there on the market? What are some of those hooks that we can think about when we're trying to get your book out to booksellers? What makes it unique and different? What makes you unique and different to be writing this project? So those are three kinds of audiences that you're going to be writing for. Um, you certainly want to give a synopsis and a description of the of the book project. This is typically maybe like a page and a half long to two pages. Um, this needs to show kind of the the it needs to provide the context for the work and your unique argument and thesis that you'll be developing across the project. Um, it might include a, a section on the methodology that you're using, um, any archives specifically that you're working with that are important to the development of this project. Um, it needs to include a kind of market overview. Again, we I just I mentioned this, this, this list of complementing or competing titles that are out there. Um, really looking towards the last three to five years um, at those titles, because that kind of demonstrates to the editor that you're au courant and you're thinking that these are, that you're really kind of engaging with contemporary dialogues. Um, and that you can kind of, you, you can see how your work is positioned in the discipline and how it might fit on a bookshelf, right? So you wanna make sure if you're working interdisciplinarily to include titles across those various dif disciplines that you're dialoguing with to, to demonstrate your knowledge of the field, but also to help our marketing team know what differentiates your work from others, right? Um, 
you want to include this kind of table of contents, the annot and so I always ask my my potential authors to include a straight table of contents, chapter with the chapters broken down, and then an annotated table of contents. Um, one thing to think about when you're kind of crafting the the um, your the structure of your book, right, is that the table of contents actually plays a very important role um, as to help people navigate through your book, but also to help sell your book. Um, lots of times I've in my experience in publishing people when they pick up a book, they look at three places, they look at the cover. They look at the back for blurbs and a chapter synopsis, who's who's endorsing this book. And then they immediately turn to that table of contents to get a sense of a roadmap, right, of where you're taking them in throughout the book. So the table of contents plays a really important role. There's really imp strategic ways to think about how you set that up. And then the annotated table of contents is where you provide about a, a paragraph per each chapter, maybe two, discussing how uh, what you do in each chapter, but most importantly, how each chapter is related to that which comes before and that which comes after. So really thinking about the through line of your book as um, as it's, it's it's a collection of it's it's all it's a collection of pieces that make a whole, right? So so the annotated table of contents, and then finally the nuts and bolts. So how long is your book? In words, we ask for words, not manuscript pages. Uh, a word count for your book, and this must include the notes, bibliography, any sort of appendices. So in total, what is the word count anticipated for your book? Um, any sort of interior art, um, music examples, tables, graphs, etc. kind of breaking down those specs for us so that we understand AV if you're thinking of doing a digital book. Um, so, so that's really important. And then finally, we always ask our potential authors to give us a list of readers um, that we might send your work out to for peer review. We have our own kind of queue of scholars and allies that we mobilize in this process, but, but we also want to hear from you who you think would be a good person to weigh in on your work. And importantly, these people should not be on your dissertation committee. Um, <laughs> that is certainly a conflict of interest. Um, but in many fields, we're working within a small field. So if these are people that, you know, you talk to or that, you know, have seen parts and pieces of your work before, I think that's pretty fine as long as they can, um, as long as, as long as we get kind of a good objective look at the, at the work itself. Um, and uh, so that's kind of the nuts and bolts, a quick hits of a good proposal. Great, great. Um, I think some people might be interested in the relationship of an editor with the author. C could you talk about what expectations do you have of authors and the flip side? What should authors expect from you in this process? Great. Yeah, great question. I think even at the early stages, um, what I'm looking for is a sense of collaboration. So um, I'm looking for authors that want to do the work, that are open to being edited, that are open to feedback, um, that can meet their deadlines. That's also very important in our industry. Um, <laughs> but also people that want to kind of come to the table with their own ideas in terms of marketing and getting the book out to different kinds of audiences. It's very much, uh, I think, success really comes when there's deep collaboration and a shared vision for the book. Um, what an edit, what an author can expect from me is I, you know, my my process personally is to really take that opportunity at the proposal and sample chapter stage to do some deep some some deep reading and deep digging with with uh, potential authors. This is, uh, you know, this is at the stage where the book is still in progress and an opportunity for us to kind of go back and forth on is the tone working is the is the scholarly apparatus working recognizing that your editor may not be an expert in your field, but that they're good readers, right? We have read so many of these kinds of books. We can come to it with a, with a sense of what makes a good reading experience. Um, and so that's what I really like to work with my authors on is helping to improve reading experiences and then using the peer review process and other forms of review to really think through the quality of the scholarship, the content of the scholarship, um, and all of that. So um, 
one kind of nuts and bolts thing when you are at the proposal stage and you are shopping around your project is to be very upfront with editors about whether or not you're considering other presses, whether or not this is out for review elsewhere. Um, especially in these days, we're all so strapped for time and resources that it's, I think it's fair to know what other labor is involved in the kind of distribution and circulation of your work. Um, so that's, yeah, I think I'll end there. Okay, uh, one more question and then we'll, we'll, we'll move on, but I'm sure there'll be time at the end for other people to ask you more questions. Can you give us a sense of the time frame? Uh, from uh, how long does it take from a proposal being accepted to a book being published? Mm -hmm. Well, so much of this is dependent on the human element, which of course is the author <laughs> um, and the peer reviewers. Um, and so we're, you know, so much of this, these early stages really do rely on that work of, of both the author and then the peer reviewers in their own kind of ecosystem of academia to turn around peer reviews and such. Typically what we look at is from proposal and sample chapter, what we call an advance uh, contracting at an advanced stage to com the completion of the manuscript um, and the publication of the manuscript is typically about two to three years. Um, so that that means that it's gone through maybe multiple rounds of peer review it's gone through a faculty board approval it's gone through and, and then production um takes about i would say anywhere from eight to 12 months so it takes about two to three years from proposal to finished book um and again that's just kind of a an estimate but uh you know taking into effect uh, into account all the different factors Thank you so much. That was so much great information packed in there. Uh, M Michael, let's move on to you as the author. So last year you published your book, Figures of the Future uh, with Princeton University Press. Um, so let's explore some of the, maybe some of the similar questions that I asked Raina, uh, but getting your point of view as, as the author. So can you talk about uh, where did the idea for your book start and what did you do with your existing scholarship in preparation for starting a book project yeah thanks thanks for for having me I'm, I'm i'm jealous that when i started the book process i didn't i didn't have this this kind of session so um yeah i'm i'm, I'm also learning um so in my case um i ended up um it took me a little bit after the dissertation to want to go back to the dissertation. So I didn't sort of immediately jump into book writing. I decided to try to get some publications out related to the dissertation and otherwise. Um, after about a year or two, sort of not uh, sort of aggressively going after the book, um, I ended up um, printing out the, the full dis dissertation. Uh, other things that I had worked on, uh, journal articles that I had written, um, I published, I, I, I got a copy of um, um, uh, turning a dissertation into a book, um, and some other things, and I actually did a kind of couple day retreat with no technology, just the manual, you know, just my materials to like really just spend some time thinking um, about, you know, what the book could look like, and uh, what elements I thought could could make remain in you know in in modified form remain in the dissertation or what part like ch chapters that I thought okay this really belongs as a journal article um, I should also say that I was doing I I ended up doing a lot of field work uh, after the dissertation um, so my book was basically the 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 time frame of, of the research was between the Obama and Trump presidency. But when I finished the dissertation, there was no Trump. Um, and so I decided after uh, the 2016 election to do more research. So I was doing field work and also trying to begin thinking about the book. Right on. Um, did you rely on anyone like advisors or any peer authors? Did you go to them for advice? And if so, what did they recommend or what did they say? Yeah, I mean, some of uh, you, you absolutely, I think, need need um, those mentors, you know, I mean, immediately you start thinking, okay, who's, who's published a book that you know, well, that can sort of tell you about their journey, their process, the more information you can get on uh, just what it's like, um, and any advice. 
Um, you know, some of this involved people who shared really early on uh, their, their book proposals, uh, their book contracts, um, uh, as well as had, um, you know, giving advice like, you know, sometimes you're not the best judge of your work, you know, so the, the tendency of maybe holding on to materials too long uh, and not sharing those materials. And so mentors, you know, really push to say, okay, you know, I, I think we we can start moving in the direction of sharing these materials, maybe having uh, some of those conversations at conferences that, that Raina mentioned uh, and begin that, that process. So the mentors were certainly helpful in kind of helping me sort of transition from kind of like sitting with um, the, the project and what I had written and moving uh, in, in the process, like beginning the process towards, towards the book. Right on. Let's talk a little bit more about the book proposal process, since we know it's such an important piece. Like, how was your approach um, in reaching out to potential publishers uh, for your for your book? Yeah. So initially, so it was I guess a kind of mix. Um, so there was in you know, one case um, or in a couple cases, there were colleagues uh, and mentors that put me in touch with editors. Um, or encouraging me to reach out to certain editors. Uh, in other cases, editors reached out because they saw my name in the program um, for the American Sociological Association. And so they asked if there was time to meet. And then when, when I uh, finished the book uh, proposal and I had the sample chapter uh, chapters ready, uh, I then I actually sent a few kind of cold emails. Um, and I didn't send the materials, I just said, you know, this is a, like in two, two or three sentences of my book project, if you're interested at all in having a conversation or seeing the, the um, proposal. So it was a mix. Um, so my conversations came from, yeah, not one route. Mm -hmm. When you were developing those proposals, were there parts that you found were difficult or that you hadn't expected or, or was it pretty straightforward for you? I mean, it, some of it was somewhat straightforward because there is, uh, as Raina mentioned, a, a, a genre and there's a kind of formula, there's like familiar sections. So, you know, the fact that I had accessible uh, various, um, you know, samples, I got, a, I, I got a feel for, okay, what, what are each of the sections demanding? What, what elements do I need to include? So it wasn't out of the blue. Uh, I think I would have found that, um, you know, uh, it would have been more challenging to write the proposal. Um, I think the, the, you know, the proposal process is also, um, it's a really key part of the process of you yourself sort of articulating, like this is, this is the project, right? And um, the dissertation is not the same, you know, and I wrote my dissertation with the expectation of a book and my committee was very open to having it not read like a dissertation typically. Um, and so, but even so, it was a different thing. And so the proposal process more than anything is like a kind of forces you to make some choices, right? About how you're framing the project and um, which, which things you're gonna foreground or background, um, you know, the organization of it. There's all these things that the proposal just, you know, demands of you. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, that, that part is challenging, you know, to start moving in the direction like this, this this um, manuscript is going to look this way. It's going to have this shape. It's going to have this narrative arc, um, you know, and of course you're going to continue to work on that after the proposal, right? I mean, it's just a proposal, but still it's like, um, I think that part was, was challenging. It's like to really um, settle. Um, I have a hard time making decisions. Sometimes I like to keep stuff in, and, and so that the pro proposal process was, you know, not challenging in the like mechanics of it, but more the sort of the thinking and the decision making that needed to go behind it. Yeah, it's sort of like a forcing mechanism to get you to commit almost like. <laughs> yeah, even if, you know, provisionally, right? Because you're going right. to get feedback along the way, you're going to change, you know, but still at that stage, yeah. Right. Well, let's talk about once your project did get the green light from Princeton, um, let's talk a little bit about the publishing con contract. Were there any parts of the the author contract that jumped out to you? And and also, people might be interested. Like, did you attempt to negotiate particular things within your contract? 
Yeah, so similar to the book proposal, because I had seen a few, you know, even some from Princeton and others, you know, like I had a, I had a sense of, okay, these are the elements that will go into the contract, um, you know. Uh, so, so then when I received the contract, it, it more or less sort of, it looked, it looked very similar to the contracts that I had seen, even ones from other presses. Um, so there wasn't anything, you know, I, was, I expected to see the section on, you know, how many copies you, you receive or, you know, the royalty, like percentages, things like that. Um, the only thing that I um, requested um, uh, due to, you know, some advice um, is the, the section of the, the contract that has to do with uh, option for the second book. Um, so that's where the press will, um, you know, be able to, you know, then your next book project, like it has to go there first. Um, and so I felt like, you know, I, I, I wanted to have some flexibility uh, with that. And they were fine. You know, they, they, they struck that from the, the contract. Uh, but otherwise, you know, it's, it seemed like a standard um, contract. Um, and I know we're going to talk about sort of copyright issues, but I was interested in sort of retaining copyright. I didn't, and I didn't know really where to go. I looked online and, and circumstances were that like, I, 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 because I didn't rush into writing the book, I needed to kind of make up for some time. So I didn't get to like explore those kind of more copyright issues, but it's certainly something that, yeah, I wish I would have been able to do. Yeah, yeah. And we will be talking uh, with Rachel a little bit more about that um, in just a minute. Um, can you can you talk a little bit about your working relationship with your editor? Like, how was that relationship? Were there certain priorities that they wanted to see? And just kind of in general, how was how was the relationship and the, the with the with the editor? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel like. Um you know, we, we met, um, this was one of these places where, where the editors reach out, the editor, have, I was at a fellowship at, at the University of Chicago and the editor um, reached out, um, I guess was in town. And so we had a, you know, we had a conversation about the book idea, very informal, um, relaxed conversation, but, you know, I felt like it was, it was a really good conversation. Um, the editor, um, communicated to me that they were both interested, but also, um, you know, we're, we're, yeah, we're just like, we had a good conversation. Like it was a good uh, conversation about the topic and its relationship to contemporary politics and things like that. Um, after the, the book contract, um, a lot of our conversations focus more on the kind of um, the process, like the, the different stages, um, trying to figure out a deadline, you know, like a, a process that made sense. Um, and then I have to say that the sort of the most intense period of the, the process happened during the pandemic. And I have to say, it just was not um, a great experience trying to finish the book um, in that period. But that, that definitely just made the process more difficult, made communication more difficult. Um, but we did, you know, uh, sometimes we would talk a lot, uh, you know, some of the feedback was, um, you know, just helpful in, in trying to think of uh, how to make arguments more, more, more punchy and less, uh, you know, uh, enliven the, 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 the writing. Um, uh, but, but, you know, one, one thing that I realized and also in communication with other authors is that, you know, editors are also very different in terms of their you know, and authors are very different, like how much, you know, the conversation do they want, you know, some authors, you know, want to kind of be left alone to do their, their work, and then they come back at a different stage. And so yeah, it became clear to me that, you know, one of the things that's, I think, very important for first time authors is to have those, those conversations at the front end with, with editors about, you know, what's their style and also what's what, what what do you want and is there you know does that vibe with you is that that the, are you going to yeah, receive the kind of support that you need or the like freedom that you want um but yeah that's that's some of the great great um what was the timeline for your book from you you know thinking you wanted to write it to it being published like what would 
how long was that for you? Yeah, I think from the time that I like, like really started um, working on the book, it was about three years. So similar to Reina's uh, point. Yeah. Okay, great. And were there certain things that you did to promote your book? And um, did Princeton also provide like promotional support? Yeah, so so some of the stuff that I did, I didn't do, which I think part of it was I was just so exhausted <laughs> from, um, is to write up, a, you know, everyone says write up an op-ed. Um, and I started working on it, but with teaching and everything, it just never, I wasn't able to finish um, that. But I did, um, in the kind of year or so before the book came out, I started being more intentional about like social media, um, using Twitter a lot more and that was at least in part motivated by you know I just wanted to like be able to share it with folks. Um, I also reached out to colleagues um, and sent emails to departments where I had not presented uh, to try to be able to you know give presentations of course most of it you know took place through Zoom um, so I did that kind of work um, and uh, Princeton had de developed a a kind of media, a media list that they that they reached out to as well. Um, you know, there was some podcasts that I did and things like that. Uh, I certainly feel like I could have been more, you know, like aggressive with, you know, getting getting the book out there. Um, and but yeah, certainly in the first few months, I was not not. Um, yeah, I was trying to recover from <laughs> from the process more than to. <laughs> promote the book, but um, totally. definitely learn some stuff for the for for the next book project about the you know, the kind of labor, the uh, trying to get people to uh, pre order before the book comes out, things like that. Um, and yeah. Right on. So maybe one last question for you um, before we move on to talking with Rachel is, do you have any other advice that you can you would like to give to PhD students in a similar role that you were, you know, as they're thinking about taking their dissertation into into a book? I'd say, I mean, as with, you know, um, you know, important things like it, it, it takes a community. Um, and I think um, even though you, you know, you may feel, and I kind of felt this way, you know, once I finished the PhD, I felt like, okay, I had been mentored wonderful, wonderfully, um, had a ton of support, and now it's like my time to do this, you know, and, and, and open up that, that mentorship time for others. But in fact, when you transition to this new space, you also need mentorship and you need support. Um, and so I think uh, that's a really important part is to build a community around like your book and your book project, um, I also think it's important not to, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, sitting with your materials, like, um, you know, finding opportunities and spaces to share your work. I think it's absolutely right that um, in the, the years prior, you know, trying to create, you know, that, that audience and that interest in your work, I think is really important. Um, you can have an incredible book, but if you haven't done that sort of work at the front end, um, which has nothing to do with the writing of it, um, you know, the book may not uh, make the kind of ripples that you would want um, if you don't do that, that work at the, the front end. Um, and, you know, I've also, you know, things that I found really useful that I, I should just mention is I did a, a book uh, workshop. Um, so where possible doing a book workshop, um, I think can be really helpful for 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 book projects, especially for first time uh, authors to get that that in depth uh, sort of feedback that you would have gotten from your committee, but now thinking about it as as a, as a broader uh, academic uh, product. Great, thank you so much, Michael, for sharing your experiences and like also passing the torch to the next <laughs> group of students that are gonna be going through this process as well. Um, appreciate your, your, your sharing your, your thoughts. Um, Rachel, let's talk with you a little bit. Um, so Michael mentioned copyright is, a, is an important aspect to think about um, throughout the publication process. Can you talk to us a little bit about, um, you know, what copyright is, uh, who gets it, what does it cover and, 
just in general, why is copyright such a key aspect of publishing in the first place? Sure. Um, well, hi, everyone. It's really great to be with you. Uh, before I dive in, I have to really quickly say, because I'm an attorney, that the information I'm going to share with you isn't legal advice. Um, but general information I've learned from my work at Authors Alliance and also from my previous life as a literary agent. So at a really high level, copyright is the legal mechanism for telling us who is allowed to make various uses of an original creative work, um, a book, a photograph, a painting. It's governed by the Copyright Act, but it actually, its roots can actually be traced to the intellectual property clause in the US Constitution. So publish, uh, copyright is not only crucial to publishing, but to our information ecosystem, and I would say the very operations of our government. So when an author writes a book or a photographer takes a picture, a sculpture, a sculptor creates a new sculpture, they will hold a copyright in that work automatically from the moment of its creation, simply by virtue of being its creator. So when you write an outline for an essay, a chapter of your dissertation, or even an email to a friend, you've created a copyrighted work and you own that copyright automatically and immediately. There are some exceptions, like when you write something at the behest of your employer, but I won't get too far into the weeds on that. And what owning a copyright really means is being the exclusive holder um, of a bundle of various rights uh, in this new creative work you've created. So the copyright holder is the only one that can reproduce the work, uh, publish it, distribute it, display it publicly, perform it, uh, create adaptations based on the work or authorize other people to exercise any one of these rights. The copyright holder can also file a lawsuit to stop others from using her exclusive rights or infringing on her copyright. And it's not necessary to register your copyright to get this protection, but registering, registering a copyright does provide some benefits. Um, and lastly, copyright protection lasts for a really long time. 70 years after, after the death of the author in most cases. And copyright is a key part of publishing because since an author gets the copyright in an original work she's created, and since these rights are, as I said, exclusive, the author needs to give her publisher permission to exercise some or all of her rights under copyright in order to produce the book. Without this permission, the publisher would be infringing on the author's copyright by doing this. Uh, this permission is all handled in the publication contract, which we'll get to a little later, um, which is where the author gives the publisher the permission to exercise some or all of the rights under copyright. So copyright is really needed to make publishing work. Um, in fact, one of the main things that motivated the very first copyright law, uh, the Statute of Anne dating back to 18th century England, was the fact that folks were reproducing books written by other people without permission and selling them for a profit. Without copyright, authors couldn't do anything to prevent this and it really hurt their livelihood. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I mean, copyright uh, rears its head oftentimes in these publishing contracts. So let's dig in a little bit more there. We know there's a lot of different provisions in publishing contracts and they can seem daunting. So could you walk us through some of the rights related sections of a, of, a, of a book contract. And one thing that we're thinking about specifically is this section called grants of rights, where an author might be asked to like transfer their copyright to a publisher, or perhaps grant an exclusive license, or another option is granting a non-exclusive license. Can you explain like what the difference is between these things? Yeah, sure. So as Tim said, uh, the grant of rights section in a publishing agreement is one of the most important sections, um, certainly one of the most important rights related sections, because it sets forth what rights the author is handing over to her publisher, laying out what the publisher is allowed to do with the work, and on what terms. So this will cover both which of the author's exclusive rights she's granting the publisher permission to use. Um, so at least publication and distribution rights but likely some of the other rights as well. How the, and also how the book will be produced, uh, whether the publisher is being granted paperback rights, ebook rights, translation rights, movie rights, et cetera. Um, and I'll say too that the terms in the grant of rights section can vary tremendously. An author can hand over some or all of her exclusive rights, uh, can do so on an exclusive or non-exclusive basis, 
and can do so temporarily or permanently. So the first, um, the first way that this can happen, as Tim mentioned, is transferring or assigning a copyright. If an author is asked to transfer their copyright to their publisher, what this means is they are permanently handing over the entirety of their bundle of rights under copyright to their publisher. When this happens, the author is no longer the copyright holder and the publisher instead ste steps into this role. Uh, this is often referred to as a work for hire or a work made for hire, and it may be identified this way in the publishing agreement. But if, instead of transferring the copyright in its entirety to the publisher, the author instead grants an exclusive license to some or all of her rights under copyright, this means that the author is agreeing to allow the publisher to be the only one who can exercise those particular rights. But the difference between an exclusive license and an assignment is that an author who grants an exclusive license still holds the copyright itself, um, even if she can no longer exercise some of the rights it provides. The author will also retain all other rights not handed over to the publisher when um, permission is given through an exclusive license. But if on the other hand, an author grants her publisher a non-exclusive license, what this means is that the author is agreeing to allow the publisher to exercise some or all of the rights under copyright, but is also retaining the ability to use these rights herself in the future or to license them to someone else. Um, finally, unlike assignments or transfers of copyright, either an exclusive or a non-exclusive license can be limited by duration. So while an assignment of copyright lasts for the full term of copyright, um, an author could grant her publisher an exclusive license for a five or 10 year period, for example. Um, and some other notable rights related sections and publication contracts include your obligations. So what you're promising with respect to your warrant, uh, with respect to your manuscript, uh, including things like topic and word count, but also things like your promises, uh, typically called warranties, with respect to the content of your work, so that it doesn't infringe anyone else's copyrights, that it's not defamatory, that it's accurate. And also your indemnity obligations, where you might be asked to promise to pay for expenses that your publisher incurs in the event of a lawsuit involving your work. Another rights-related section is your publisher's obligations on the road to getting your book to market. Things like the timing of publication, what the book will look like, how it will be priced, how it will be advertised. And a final rights related section to be aware of is the set of terms that happen that governs what happens if you part ways. So if your publisher is acquired, if your book is no longer selling any copies, or if you or your publisher um, breaches or violates the terms of the agreement. Right on. I we know that a lot of uh, book publishers or more book publishers now are um, entertaining the idea that authors can publish under open access terms. Can you talk a little bit about what this means from a copyright per perspective? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so when a work is published open access, and I'm sorry, if many folks in the room already know this. Uh, it's accompanied by an open access license that permits others to make certain specified uses of that work. Unlike the traditional all rights reserved model um, we see in conventional publishing where all rights are reserved to the author or the publisher, the general public is permitted to do certain things with the work of made available under an open access license, like share it or distribute it to others. Uh, the terms of open access licenses can vary a lot, uh, generally, at a minimum, they'll require attribution on the part of the secondary user. Uh, this isn't a copyright issue, it's just something that's pretty much always included in these license terms. Um, but whatever rights the open access license gives to the general public, the copyright holder retains ownership of the copyright itself, um, and also the remaining rights in the bundle of rights that aren't included in the open access license or haven't already been conveyed to someone else. So open, open access publishing can be a really great op option for an author passionate about seeing their works reach wide audiences. Um, this is the position of Authors Alliance members. So we talk about open access a lot, um, but who also care about retaining certain rights in their work. Um, my final note on open access publishing is that authors pursuing open access publishing should be aware of whether there are other parties that hold rights in their work. So if you have a conventional print publisher, who's um, creating a paperback edition of your work or 
some kind of print version, um, but you'd also like to publish an ebook, open access. The rights that the open access license conveys to users and the general public could potentially conflict with rights you've handed over to your publisher. So if you find yourself in a situation like this, it's a really good idea to start a conversation with your publisher early on in the process um, to, to sort this out and make sure license terms don't conflict and it's consistent with both of your goals. Right, and maybe to build on that, um, we wanted to get your thoughts about what authors might need to know about third-party rights, especially if they want to include like images or other types of media into their books that they obviously didn't create themselves. Um, can you talk about that a little bit and how authors might approach that? And maybe how, if you know, how publishers sort of like um, allow that or not? <laughs> yeah, uh, permissions clearance is a tough part of the publication process for a lot of authors. Um, this is because publication contracts generally place responsibility for clearing rights with the author. And some publishers provide a lot of gu guidance, but others don't. Um, so it's this, it's this part of publishing that can feel kind of legal, but where the author is sometimes just on their own, um, left to figure this out. Uh, I'll say here that Authors Alliance has a dedicated guide to third-party permissions that we just released last year. Um, I'm the author and I really tried to orient a lot of the guidance towards graduate students. So I wanna offer this as a resource um, in general. It has a lot more information than I can cover right now, but I'm going to attempt a quick rundown. So one huge consideration when securing rights for images or other types of third-party content is whether you need permission in the first place. Uh, the doctrine of fair use provides really powerful protection for authors using others' works without permission for certain purposes like commentary, criticism, or teaching. Um, fair use is particularly applicable in the scholarly context because scholarly writing often uses third-party works for commentary or criticism. Um, so it's particularly, I think it's for all of you, particularly relevant. And I'll say too, an understanding of how fair use applies can help authors understand whether they need to get permission and obviate the need to do this at all in some circumstances. Another important consideration, um, more on the practical side and less on the copyright side, is that permissions clearance can take a long time. Um, it's prudent to start early, though not before you have a publication contract for your book. Um, it's, not, it's not wise to go too down the road of clearing permissions for publication when publication is uncertain. Uh, finding a rights holder can also be a little bit tricky. Um, publishers may be able to help point you in the right direction. And again, our guide has a lot of suggestions on this front, so I'll offer it again as a resource. Um, finally, it's really important to think about your budget. Publishing contracts often place the, the burden of paying for permission fees with the author, in addition to the burden of actually doing the clearance. Um, and fees can add up really quickly. So like the publication contract, uh, you can negotiate the terms of your license to use third-party content. Rights holders might even agree to give you a free permission if you can explain your position and your project. Great, I think the, the last thing I wanted to get your thoughts on is about negotiating author agreements. What advice can you give to you know, prospective authors about how to approach and how to engage in productive negotiations around a book contract. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, of course. Um, okay, so here too, Authors Alliance has a really long guide. Uh, it's called Understanding and Negotiating Publication Contracts. It's available for free on our website. Uh, it's our longest guide and it has so much more information than I can cover. Uh, but to summarize, um, the publisher is almost always the party that drafts the publishing agreement. But an author does not have to sign the first version of the contract that their publisher sends over. Um, an author might, like Michael, have you with any problems with the agreement, but they might wanna request a lot of changes. Um, and this is where negotiation comes in. So if you're interested in negotiating your contract, uh, an obvious, somewhat obvious, but important first step is to read it in its entirety. Um, if anything is confusing to you, you can ask your publisher questions. So just understanding what this starting point is, is really important. Um, you should think about what works for you and what doesn't, whether there's anything important missing, um, whether it's retaining your copyright or being able to reclaim rights in the future. 
um, whether there are any deal breaker position provisions, sort of how far apart you and your publisher are, um, and where you might be willing to compromise. Uh, then <laughs> the author simply asked the publisher to change the contract. Um, I'm laughing a bit here because this is a lot more easily said than done. Uh, there's a very obvious power imbalance between publishers and authors. You know, publishers have contract managers and legal departments, whereas typical authors, certainly first time authors, um, tend to lack these resources. So because of this, you should be prepared for some back and forth um, and potential pushback from your publisher. But in our experience, publishers can be a lot more flexible and willing to compromise if you explain why you're asking for the various contract language you are. Um, so if you if you really want to publish an open access ebook uh, and you explain why this is so important to you, we think it, in our experience, your publisher is like a bit more likely to accommodate that. Um, but your mileage may vary with all of these things. Uh, it's a huge and difficult issue. Um, so again, I'll, I'll suggest checking out our guide or um, looking at other online resources as you approach this. Thank you so much, Rachel. I put in one link to the publication contracts guide, but maybe there's the other one that you can put in the chat too to share. Um, well, thank you to all of our panelists. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now and just open it up to the floor for anyone who has questions, and we can engage in a conversation now um, with our with our panelists and with uh, the people on the call. So let me just stop this.